for three um, three projects, um, which resulted in a total of 1.4 million in requests, um, and that represents about 217 affordable units, almost evenly split between um, new construction and rehabilitation. And all of the pro uh, projects are rental projects this time around. So um, our first presenter is for the Chrisman Two Apartments and we have Danny with MGL and then Lisa also with Longmont Housing Authority. So I will let you guys take it away. Hey, thank you so much, Molly. Thank you, Karen, for putting this together. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, well, if you wouldn't mind throwing up my PowerPoint, I figured we, you know, it's nice. I'm sure you like looking at me, but maybe pictures of the property would be better. So let's look at that. And then I will ask you, Aliberto, maybe to just advance the slides, if that's okay. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, wonderful. Right one. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you again so much for having us. Um, I'm Danny Vachon. I'm a development manager with MGL Partners. Um, Ellie Berto, you can go ahead and advance the slide. Those are just some images of some recent developments of ours. You can go ahead and advance the slide once more. I'm just gonna share a little bit about our company. Um, go ahead and advance. Oh, great. Um, so MGL is a Denver-based developer. We're focused in Colorado. Um, we've developed over $800 million worth of property across all multifamily rental sectors. So affordable housing, workforce housing, class A or luxury housing, senior independent living, assisted living, and memory care. We've been in the business for over 16 years. I've been with the company for about two and a half. And before then I was working in Boulder County um, with Boulder Housing Partners doing their development. Go ahead and advance the slide. So this is just an overview of our different business lines and kind of how they break out between the affordable workforce market rate, if you will, and senior housing. Um, of the 42% of the affordable housing work that we've done, it's sort of split between work that we've done as development by ourselves, uh, which is what I'm presenting to you tonight, Christmas two, and then work that we've done as a financial or development consultant. So you, I've come to you in the past two years um, for Cinnamon Park Apartments, where we were working on behalf of senior housing options. Um, we provide all kinds of different services as far as the affordable housing, um, consulting services for, you know, property giving expertise on tax exempt bonds, low income housing tax credits, historic tax credits, grants, cash flow loans, subordinate debt, land leases, and then construction and perm debt. Go ahead and advance the slide. So here's our resume snapshot, um, specifically to Longmont. MGL, in partnership with the Longmont Housing Authority, delivered 114 units in 2018 at Chrisman One Apartments. Um, Chrisman has been extremely successful over the past several years and has maintained a 97 to 99% occupancy even throughout the pandemic. Um, most recently, two weeks ago, we closed on Cinnamon Park Apartments. Uh, construction is already underway. Um, and I want to uh, thank you very much to this group for, for funding that project and giving even more funds over the course of the project um, as we were dealing with some construction cost escalation issues. Uh, we absolutely couldn't do it without you. And I'm I'm, I'm thrilled to tell you that we crossed the finish line and we are starting construction. So that should be delivered 25 senior affordable units in spring 2022. Um, go ahead and advance the slide. So here are just some pictures of Christman Apartments. This is the first phase. And what I'll be, what I'm asking for tonight is funding for the second phase. So it was 114 units of affordable I'll note that it was only one and two bedroom units. Um, Christman two, we will be offering three bedroom units. About 26 million in total development costs. 
three-story wood frame walk-ups, so no elevators, but, uh, and surface parking. And it's, it's well parked. We have had um, people go out and count for us and there's significant, there's, you know, between five and 10 spaces that are free on an average weekday night. So we're not spilling out into the neighborhood. It was appropriately parked. Go ahead and advance the slide. Here's an aerial view of Chrisman, uh, Chrisman Apartments. And the, the green that you're seeing in the, the forefront of the photo is where Chrisman 2 will be. Advance the slide. Here's an image of our exercise room. I just wanted to give a little taste of what it looks like. So we will also have an exercise room at Christmas too. They're very well utilized. Please advance the slide. And this is just a rendering of Cinnamon Park Apartments to give you a little taste of what that's gonna look like. Again, 25 units of affordable senior housing, about a $9.2 million total cost, two-story wood frame, this one with an elevator as it's serving seniors and surface parking. Please advance the slide. And here is, um, you can see to the right-hand side here where it's the proposed two-story building. That's currently a vacant lot. The other two buildings exist as assisted living right now, owned by senior housing options. So this will be a wonderful uh, addition into the neighborhood to kind of fill out the neighborhood. Please advance the slide. So now I'm getting to our request to you tonight, Chrisman 2 Apartments. It is a buy right project at 83 units. It's going to be 100% affordable family housing, just like Chrisman 1, 36 one bedrooms, 38 two bedrooms, and then nine of those three bedroom units that were not offered, but are often requested at Chrisman 1. Um, at the at the request of Longmont Housing Authority and the city of Longmont, we have increased the number of accessible units from five, which is 5%, to 10%. So a total of nine accessible units will be available. And then another two units will be hearing and vision um, impaired. Um, so the demand, you know, it's really interesting. We are proposing to do an average income project. And for those who don't know what that is, the IRS agreed to allow low-income housing tax, tax credit projects to, um, to provide housing up to 80% of the area median income. However, the caveat is that the entire project has to average to 60% of AMI or below. So right now in the greater Longmont primary market area, there aren't any units that have deed restrictions at 70 or 80% of AMI. So this project will offer both. Um, and across that entire primary market area as well, there are only 18 units at 30% of AMI. This project will offer nine more units at 30% of AMI, which is pretty significant. Um, there were a significant number of units at 60% of AMI. So we, um, while talking with the Longmont Housing Authority and CHAFA, we agreed to lower that number and kind of do the barbell approach. So more 70s and 80s, 50s, 40s, 30s. So we are only offering four units at 60% of AMI. Um, but 59% of the overall units are at 50% of AMI or below which is uh, the majority of people looking for affordable housing. Um, 3.4 acres directly north of that phase one, Chrisman phase one on Ute Highway, but with the buffer off the highway. Um, there will also be a fence between the apartment and Ute Highway just for safety concerns. Um, and it's in a qualified census tract, which gives us a 30% equity basis boost when we're requesting low-income housing tax credits. Please advance the slide. Here's an aerial rendering of what the second phase will look like. So it's going to be four different buildings. And the top of the picture is sort of looking north. I'm sorry, it's, it's sort of looking uh, southeast. So you can sort of tell the Murphy's gas station 
uh, between the main street and the project, and then this kind of buffer zone out to the to the north um, as you're looking toward Ute Highway. Next slide, please. And here's a little bit more of a view of the project from the exterior. Um, it's going to have balconies very similar to phase one, a little bit of a different roof line. It's going to have a bit of a pitched roof. That is a cost saving feature that we determined after speaking with our general contractor and our architect. Um, but other than that, it's very similar in all of its features to Chrisman One. Please advance the slide. So now I'm just gonna touch briefly on MGL and LHA's unique partnership. So Chrisman One Apartments, um, we partnered with Longmont Housing Authority as a special limited partner. They received a split of the developer fee and are continuously receiving a split of the cash flow and the deferred developer fee. Um, they will take over management and ownership of Chrisman One and that was part of our negotiation with Chrisman Two. We want them to, we want LHA to take over ownership and management at the same time for both. So LHA agreed to extend that ownership takeover Chrisman One. So it's the same time as Chrisman Two. We expect that to be in 2028. So our agreement with Chrisman Two um, with our partnership. So what happened when we finished Crispin One is we reached out to Longmont Housing Authority and we said, listen, there's this land just to the north. We don't have it under control, but it's available, it's on the market. And at that time, there was some transition going on at the Longmont Housing Authority and they determined that it was not the best time for them to move forward with another development project. So fast forward to the beginning of 2021, Longmont Housing Authority reached out to MGL and said, now is a better time. We went ahead and uh, uh, spoke to the broker and the owner of that parcel and got it under contract. So that's where we're at right now. We went in for a, uh, we went in for a non-competitive CHAFA application together on May 1st, and we were awarded um, competitive bond cap from CHAFA, and we will be receiving our non-competitive award of tax credits imminently. Um, we Together, we determined that it was the best course of action to go forward with a 4% non-competitive application to CHAFA due to the high risk of not getting an award in the state tax credit round, which is annually every August. Um, Longmont decided that they wanted the delivery of units before then. And in exchange, they were helping us, they will help us kind of cover that gap that the state tax credit would um, typically fund. So that's where we're kind of at today. Like I mentioned before, we have that coterminous exit date for the ownership and management. Uh, we expect that to be about four years after Chrisman 2 stabilizes. Again, just like Chrisman 1, LHA will have this, a significant share of both the developer fee and the cash flow of the project. And LHA has, because we're getting in at the very beginning here, they have a lot of influence over the design, the unit mix, and uh, the AMI level served. Please advance the slide. So lastly, I'm going to talk about our specific request. So we have requested $950,000 and it's split between $600,000 in affordable housing funds and $350,000 of CDBG funds. Um, if you can see off to the right, when I originally went into CHAFA with our application, we said that we thought we might be able to we thought we might need 1.2 million from Longmont Housing Authority. This number is a number that I will get into, but we expect over time that pricing will kind of level out on the construction pricing. Right now we have a construction escalation line item in our development budget. We hope that we don't need to use all of that. 
we hope that lumber pricing and other kind of commodity pricing will just level out in the next several months as everything starts opening back up after COVID. Um, the other thing is corporate tax liabilities have been very low over the past year and a half due to the pandemic. And that has put pressure down and decreased um, the demand for low income housing tax credits from large corporations. So they have you know, taken down the price because it's not as nearly in high demand. So one, we expect construction costs to kind of start, um, you know, at least plateauing. And then we believe that our, um, our tax credit pricing will increase over time. We also think that rents will increase. We were very conservative on our rents. So we also hope that those increase. Lastly, um, it's possible that the Longmont Housing Authority will have vouchers that they are able to put on this project, which would also help with cash flow and decreasing our overall ask for funding. Um, let's see, what else do I have on here? Uh, the other very important thing to note is that uh, because we are building phase one and phase two, they're side by side projects, there's a lot of efficiencies that we can realize mainly in our property management and maintenance budgets, but also in kind of the sharing of outdoor amenity space and parking if need be. Um, I don't think that that will be an issue based on what I said before, um, but it, it really is an opportunity to kind of have some efficiencies. And please advance the slide. And this is just my contact information. Um, and I'll open it up for questions. Thanks, Danny. Are there questions from staff or board members? Graham. Yeah, hi, thank you, Danny, for your time and presentation. Of course. Um, I, I guess I'm a little confused about the cash flow repayment of the, the 600,000, um, particularly <laughs> Especially you, given that Longmont Housing Authority will be an owner, you said 2028, mm -hmm. and based on your construction schedule, you think units will be available 2024. So, is the idea that if it all works out according to your your budgeting, the cash flow would happen and you would repay City of Longmont in that four years before Housing Authority absorbed it? No, it would be a long term cash flow note. So it would just be paid. It would be absorbed by the new ownership, Longmont Housing Authority, and they would just continue to pay the cash flow note unless they, unless Kathy, you have a different idea, but I was assuming it would just be continuously paid through the cash flow, um, just the same it was originally um, underwritten. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Madam um, Chair, this is Brian. May I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, Danny, thank you so much for the presentation and I'm sorry that I couldn't see the visuals. Um, can you, I'm not familiar with your organization. Could you speak a little bit to the, the way that low income housing fits into your mission as a, an organization and as a developer? Of course. So, um, MGL Partners is uh, made of Mike Gerber, Greg Glade, and Lisa Mullins. They were all partners together at a firm called Black Creek in Denver doing high-end market rate development. And about 16 years ago, they decided that they wanted to have more of a mission-based company. However, they still wanted to be a for-profit entity. So they... Uh, they started MGL Partners, and I would say for the first several years of our existence, we only did affordable housing. Um, now we have kind of, um, so over those 16 years, different opportunities have arisen and um, different investors have come on board. And so we've kind of branched out to the several different um 
kinds of rental multifamily. So the market rate, the workforce housing, and the senior living. But right now, about 42% of our entire portfolio is affordable housing. So we really focus on developing LIHTC housing. Um, currently, we have about seven different projects that we are, are in various different um, stages of development uh, and under construction. And that ranges from new construction all the way to deep renovation. Um, and then we also work in capacity as a... And, that those are not just as MGL as the developer. We are developers, but then we also work as a um, development consultant and a financial consultant for nonprofits and housing authorities. That is the lion's share of our affordable housing business. So the, the seven projects going right now are a combination of MGL owned properties as well as um, properties that we're working as a development consultant on. That's very helpful. Thank you. Of course. Kathy, I think you might have had a question or a comment. Yeah, Danny, when you said that the um, Christman one is well parked, did you get a parking reduction for that at all? Or does it I just meet code? I think we did. I think it met code. Okay. But we had the property manager go out, I think it was about a month ago, and count on a weeknight. And there were between five and 10 spaces open over the course of, I think like two different nights that she counted. So. That's what makes sense to me, but um, there's some studies going on and some thought processes that not as much parking is needed in an affordable yeah. project, which I probably would agree with for a senior project, but not so much for family. So I just was wondering what the, and we can check that out too and find out if you got the reduction or if, some kind of averaging or whatever happened with that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that we did. I think that that was sort of a negotiation with the neighborhood at the time, but we would not be asking for a reduction in this instance, I believe because of the level of affordability and the number of units below 50% at 50% or below, we are, I think we're exceeding parking. Um, the beauty of exceeding parking on this kind of a property is there are spaces that can be turned into garden beds, uh, raised garden beds or other kind of useful, meaningful outdoor space afterward. Um, but I will say that just due to the nature of the location in very North Longmont, I think a lot of the families might be commuting to their jobs uh, elsewhere in Boulder County or, or North in Weld. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. I would just like to know uh, if I could get a copy um, of the presentation. Yeah, we've got that. We can send that out, Madeline. That'd be stupid. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you so much, Danny. If there aren't any other questions, and I think we have another presentation. Is that right? Oh, yes, Graham. Oh, just one quick question. Um, How is the Lawmont Housing Authority to work with compared to Denver? Um, similar the Denver Housing, housing Authority? Yeah. Or mm -hmm. Um, I personally have not worked with DHA in a long time in a partnership capacity. Hmm. Um, I would say Longman Housing Authority is much smaller. There's a lot less red tape. Um, we seem very amenable to kind of working together. Um, I think we put together a very successful partnership on Christmas One. Um, I'm excited for them to take over and I'm thrilled that they are willing to be lockstep with us to put Christman too on out on the market. So good. Cool. Thank you. I, I would add that <clears throat> the only re reason we really considered an um, income averaged project like this, because we have not done one of these before is because Lisa, our new um, regional property manager at Longmont housing authority. said they do them all the time and where she came from in Nevada. So she was well used to them and knew how to um, make sure 
everything was in compliance once we take over um, and that it's a piece of cake, I think was her, her wording. So <laughs> it's a new venture all the way around. I'll add one quick thing about the average income. I wanna make sure everyone knows that we have underwritten the 70 and 80% AMI rents much lower than 70 and 80% because those are typically more at market right now. We want to give future residents the ability to make more income to still qualify, but still have an affordable rent. So that has been taken into consideration. So Caitlin, this is Karen. So I don't know, uh, Lisa, do you have anything you want to to add? You want to say hello? So <laughs> <laughs> no, I think Danny's covered everything. We're just very excited to enter into another partnership and eventually take over management of both Christman 1 and 2. All right, great. Thanks, Lisa. Just housekeeping, do you need me to stay on for future questions or do you wanna send me an email? I'm just going to be around or is, is my portion done? Um, <clears throat> I would say it's up to you if you wanna hang out. Otherwise, I, you do not have to. <laughs> if there's anything that's significant that we need to um, get from you, I will email or we will just check in um, tomorrow or Monday. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Go abs. Yes. Oh God, Thanks, Dan. Danny. I, <laughs> good for you. Root them on. <laughs> All right. Uh, Karen, I'll turn it back to you. We can turn it back to Molly. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. So the, the next That's presenter good. is um, from Stonehenge Apartments. We have Nicole, Aaron, and Ricky here. Um, this is um, the one rehabilitation uh, project that we have. So I will let them give us an overview. Good evening. Thanks so much for, uh, for hosting this, Molly uh, and Karen. I know we've gone back and forth a little bit about uh, this project, but we we were interested in putting in an application for Stonehenge Apartments specifically because um, in, the, in, in the past we had tried to get the windows and the sliding glass doors replaced at this property through a partnership with Energy Outreach Colorado. And what we found was that the, the energy efficiency improvements were just shy of what we needed to qualify through that initiative. So because these funds are available for affordable housing communities specifically, we wanted to get our hat in the ring here. So um, we have Ricky, Nicole, and myself. Uh, I'm an asset manager with Capital Realty Group. Capital Realty Group is the owner and manager of uh, property management company for Stonehenge Apartments. Um, Capital Realty purchased this property in 2012, and it's a wonderful, stable, affordable community. We are engaged in a 20-year HAP contract with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And this property is 100% project-based Section 8, uh, so 100% affordable here. Um, I want to, it looks like we have our PDF up. I'm going to have Ricky start by just talking a little bit about the property, and then we'll, we'll circle back to Capital Realty Group and sort of our, our portfolio-wide initiatives that we've done um, and other partnerships that we've had with, with government agencies um, for um, upgrades and rehabs. Great, if thank you. Yeah, if you can advance that slide for us, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ricky Garcia. I am the property manager here for Stonehenge Apartments. Um, and just gonna gonna give you guys a little property history on us. We were built uh, back in 1976, uh, so we've you know we've been here in Longmont for a very very long time. Uh, we currently have 114 units. Uh, 113 of those are for um, are all occupied. Um, one of those units is a substation uh, for the police. Um, all our units are, uh, we have one, two, three, and four bedroom, uh, 12 one bedroom, 72 bedroom, uh, 28 three bedroom, and four uh, four bedroom. Um, uh, overall footage, uh, I got it wrong on the on this presentation here. It's actually going to be about 297,000 square feet. Um, and you, if you can please advance the, the slide for me, please. Um, 
these are just some quick pictures of, you know, what the inside of our units look like. Um, you know, as I said, they're townhouse, townhome style. So got the bottom floor, living room, kitchen. And then, of course, uh, you know, you go upstairs, you got your two bedrooms and your restroom. Uh, if you could uh, advance the slide. Um, so we are, like as I said before, we are a Section 8 community, um, subsidized. So we do everything in-house. Uh, we go off at 30 percent of income. Um, and, you know, all, all our units are there for, uh, you know, any and all qualifying um, applicants. You know, we uh, we have two on-site laundry. Um, we have this little picnic or this little uh, playground area that we uh, brought in. I want to say it was 2016, 2018, Aaron. Actually, it was 2019 and it was 2019. Uh, brand new replacement. Yeah. Yep. So we, we just put that in. Um, and uh, yeah, we, you know, we're, we're, we're excited. I, we're excited to, to start this project and get these uh, windows and sliding doors replaced. Uh, I believe the windows have been in here since the, the, the these, these apartments were installed. So um, it's, it's a long time in the making and, um, uh, one thing I forgot to mention is, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we, we just, we're, we're excited. We're excited to, to hopefully get this going and, and, uh, bring this, bring this new light to this, this growing community that's, that's been here for a very long time that has, um, improved in, in many, many positive ways. And, um, so thank you guys. Um, and then you can go ahead and advance the slide. Um, again, this is just another picture of, you know, the substation that we have here, entrance. Um, and then Aaron, I will let you take it on over. Sure. So it, with Capital Realty Group, we own about 15,000 units across the country. 100% of our portfolio uh, is affordable. Um, all of our properties are involved in at least one layer of affordability, if not um you know, Section 8 and LIHTC combined or uh, Section, you know, 202 crack things like that as well. So that is our entire mission. We, we've been in business since 1990 and uh, it's been a really good, a really very, very successful uh, ride. When I started with them about eight years ago, they only had about 24 properties and they've uh, really become a big player in the affordable housing market, um, specifically because of their investment in the communities that they serve. So in this case, um, you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to come to the city to appeal for funds for this project is specifically because the residents uh, pay the utility costs here. So in 2017, we had done an extensive survey with the uh, Energy Outreach Colorado and a couple of other um, rebate consultant agencies as well, just to see what our options were. Uh, and we ended up moving forward with a, a couple of great incentives. Um, we did um, exterior lighting upgrades, interior lighting upgrades throughout the community, uh, as well as um, added insulation in the attic units. Uh, but company-wide, we work with local governments and, and um, energy efficiency, uh, utility companies, and so on, very, very frequently, all the time. Um, in Denver right now, we own a, a senior facility, affordable, called uh, Tower at Spear. Um, that's 172 units that serve seniors and disabled folks. And um, we are right now in the very final stage. We're actually waiting for the very final inspection uh, on a project to replace the entire boiler system, uh, upgrade the lighting inside and outside, uh, a bunch of other um, HVAC upgrades as well there, uh, all, all in this partnership between Energy Outreach Colorado as well as the city of Denver and um, the Department of Energy. Uh, so this is something that we, you know, it's kind of our bread and butter. We were very surprised to hear that at Stonehenge, the windows and sliding glass doors didn't quite fit into the metric uh, to get this approved in when we did that survey. Uh, however, we think that the benefits of this, of this work is going to enormously benefit our residents. Uh, as I said, the residents are responsible for uh, paying the electric utility here. And although the, the rent is offset by that utility allowance, of course, uh, we still know that if we can increase the energy efficiency of the windows and sliding glass doors, uh, it's going to lower that utility bill for them, which you know we hear is a big priority from our residents. So with all of that in mind, um, obviously this is a much more straightforward request than um, the other two uh, new construction projects, but I'll open it up for questions about, about Stonehenge or Capital or anything else. 
Great, thanks, Aaron. Graham, I see a hand. A virtual hand, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Aaron and Ricky. I'm curious to understand your um, the organizations for this uh, this property, prudent reserve or maintenance funds. Um, do you set aside money every year for these kinds of improvements? Yeah, we do. Um, we utilize those the the reserve funds. And I had actually sent Molly. I think it was a little bit late in the afternoon here, so I don't know if she had a chance to review what I had attached, but. We sent her our most recent reserve draw. So you see that that money is being utilized pretty regularly. We do, you know, quarterly draws on that. Um, we invest pretty heavily in the community. So unfortunately, you know, this is this is outside of uh, the um, standard R and R that we might have in that in that balance. And do you have um, proposals from contractors to do the work and provide the windows? Yeah, we do. Um, I had sent a couple of pretty outdated ones just from the last time that we looked into this option. Um, but but yes, we have partnerships with national window suppliers to make this process quite easy unless, you know, because many times when we work with local agencies, one of the requirements is that we use a network of preferred vendors, which is perfectly fine as well. In this case, I think that's pretty, from what I'm understanding, that's pretty open-ended, which is great. Good. Thank you. Um, I have a question, Erin. So um, those bids are from 2016 um, and it looks like the request for funding is sort of at the high end of what the bids were. Um, what is the plan if um, the current costs for doing that actually, you know, exceeds this grant money? Um, yeah. what, what commitment does, um, you know, the management company have for um, making up any additional costs? Yeah, great question. I spoke with the owners about this directly. So of course, as you know, Danny was talking about in the previous presentation, material costs and the variability there on those costs is a huge factor right now. I also share the optimism that those commodity costs will uh, lower, will stabilize. Um, I spoke with the owner about this. You know, obviously, when we're requesting funding, we're basing it off of the estimates that we can produce at that very moment. The window from when we were notified of the funding to the application deadline was. A little bit too small for us to squeeze in getting additional bids, but we're happy to do so um, here now. Um, the owner is perfectly comfortable with with an owner contribution here because he also sees the value of getting this done. Is there any maximum owner contribution that you would expect to Not have? Any game. No. no, he takes the he takes you know if if there's a partnership in place, there's certainly an incentive for him to come you know come to the table. Brian, nice to see your face. <laughs> You're very kind, thank you. Um, Aaron, quick question. I noticed on the, the slide that talked about the inspections that yeah. the, um, the, the language was familiar to me in terms of trying to position something that could be misunderstood in the light that you wanted to. Um, so my question is, in terms of inspections in these kinds of units, do you run into particular challenges with the perception that they're inequitable, that they're targeted, that anything like that, or are these just really routine and your your tenants widely accept them? Oh yeah, our our tenants, yeah, this this our tenants are very wonderful here, but actually what that was referring to is our obligation to the HUD inspections that we have through as, a, as a, an obligation through the HAP contract, specifically for the REAC inspections that occur here. One of the findings that the, the inspectors have during those, those REACs is when the seal breaks on windows and sliding glass doors, if there's a condensation buildup or evidence of condensation buildup in those panes, um, that can be a major point deduction. So. I wanted to just simply kind of speak to that just a hair, just to mention that, yes, there is a benefit to the owner here. Uh, the benefit is that, you know, it, it, it solves a problem with those REAC inspections. Uh, but I really do feel that the biggest benefit is to the residents with the reduction in that utility cost. Thank you. Um, do you have an estimate of um, the rough uh, impact on those utility costs for residents? You know what? I don't. I'm sure that I could get one for us. I'm sure that I could get one for us. I've done that in the past, um, just based off of the specs, you know, of what, what they'd be planning on installing. 
Are there other questions or comments from folks? Kathy. So Capital Realty Group is a, a for-profit or a nonprofit? Is it more like um, MGO where it's a for-profit developer? Well, they they're not, a, they're not developers. They purchase um, established assets. Many times they focus on distressed or neglected assets as kind of their bread and butter. Um, we have a, you know, it's been a very successful model. They purchase properties and manage simultaneously. So there's no third party management contract. Um, the biggest benefits in the owner's mind of doing it that way is that there is a direct connection between the ownership and the property operations. So um, very successful model. They are a, a for-profit entity, but 100% of their portfolio is engaged in those half contracts um, around the country. Okay. Um, and then on our staff analysis, under accessibility, it shows 113 units. Are all 113 fully ADA accessible or how many do you have? No, I apologize for the confusion on that. So the only, none of the units would, would uh, qualify for the modern ADA de definition of, of accessibility within the unit. But we do have 12 one bedroom apartments, six of which are on the first floor. Um, so we have made modifications to those apartments as requested. Uh, some of them are have more accessibility features than others, but truly only six of them can even have the possibility to fall in that classification. Thank you. Other questions from folks? All right. Thank you, Erin and Ricky. And Molly, I will turn it back to you for our next presentation. And, and Nicole, Nicole was on here too. We didn't really get to. <laughs> Nicole, did you want to say anything or? <laughs> you know what? If I, if I can mention, um, Nicole been the on-site property manager there for the last four years. She recently got promoted out of her role. She's now playing a compliance role within the company. So she wanted to be involved because, uh, of course, the blood, sweat, and tears at Stonehenge myself as well. I'm sorry, Nicole, you didn't have a, a, a opportunity to say a whole lot, but... <laughs> That, that's okay. I'm happy to be here. You know, Stonehenge is my baby and I want to see it succeed. So I'm here for moral support today, I guess. Good job, guys. <laughs> Thanks all very much. We appreciate it. Okay, so Nicole and Aaron and Ricky, you can uh, leave the building unless you're dying to stay, and then we'll move on to the next presentation. Thanks very much. Thanks so much. We appreciate Good night. It. Thank you. So our last presentation is um, from Sunset Element for their Sunset Heights project, which is over um, near the suites, um, and it will be new construction. And I know that Kevin is here and Scott and Chris. So you guys can go ahead. And, and Catherine was on early. So um, hopefully she, she comes back. <laughs> she said she'd be back at 745. So I'll watch for her too. Kevin, you're on mute. Oh, um, Catherine just said that she's in the waiting room. Is there somebody oh. who can let her in, please? Hmm. Were you able to let her in? I am right now. Okay. And I think we've got a shared screen that's working maybe as expected, I'm not sure. Might be, uh, might be working too well. So let's just give Kevin a second to uh, organize himself. 
Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Kevin, we still can't hear you. And it doesn't look like you're muted, Kevin, so it might just have the wrong microphone on for your audio. OK, how about that one? Good. We can hear you. Good. Sorry about that. Uh, let's get moving. Uh, I'm Kevin Knapp, uh, and this is a presentation for Sunset Heights. I'd like to start with a quick overview of the project. Sunset Heights is designed to be a permanent supportive housing community for individuals that have experienced homelessness. The latest iteration of the design includes 55 one bedroom apartments with both indoor and outdoor community spaces for residents and staff. We are partnered with many on the project, including the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless, who will be the lead services provider, the Longmont Housing Authority, who will be the property manager, and the city of Longmont, who's provided a subsidized option agreement for the land along with LHA. The project began as a partnership between Element Properties and the Boulder Shelter with the belief in their housing first approach. Nearly three years after we started down this road, the need for the project is greater than ever. Over the last year alone, 1,050 people were screened through Boulder County's coordinated entry system. The pandemic and growing local housing prices has created a greater need for the project. Sunset Heights will provide the, the deepest affordability for the lowest incomes in our community. Having now been through two 9% application rounds, we're looking, for, uh, looking to strengthen the project before resubmitting in 2022. We believe the best way to strengthen the project and our application is to complete the local approval process in the second half of this year. We started with the modest request of $100,000 and we stretched those dollars to get us through the first two tax credit applications. The $150,000 we're asking for this evening will allow for the design and engineering work necessary to complete the project entitlements. To quickly summarize, the demand for the project is greater than ever. The ability to proceed with the local project approval will strengthen the project's next tax credit application. And a fully entitled project will be shovel writing in Shaffer's view. It's very important given the volatile construction prices that I know the other groups were talking about. And, um, some of the pushback that other PSH projects have received. So as I mentioned, we have uh, our full team here tonight. Uh, Scott Holton, Chris Jacobs, and Catherine Bean are my partners and co-presenters who have also been working me on, with me on the project for the last few years. So why Sunset Heights? The recent update is that sun the Sunset Heights application was unsuccessful in the 2021 9% tax credit round. Disappointing result after spending much of 2020 advancing the project. We worked really hard to bring down costs after the previous 9% round when we received the feedback that the project was too expensive. That resulted in aggregate project costs dropping by a half million dollars while the project actually grew by five units. We actually picked up the building and moved it on the site, which created a substantial amount of savings. This year, year's feedback received from Chaffa was that there wasn't anything wrong with the project and they encouraged us to return for another application round. However, Chaffa's Tax Credit Allocation Committee did emphasize that they highly value shovel-ready projects, an indication that the project would be more competitive if it wasn't titled. Our project vision remains the same. We're committed to delivering the project and committed to the belief that the best way to solve homelessness is with housing. As I mentioned earlier, our request is for $150,000 of pre-development funding to allow us to further 
the design and engineering work necessary to complete the project approval with the city's planning and development department. The, the intent of doing that is being able to tell Chaffa in the next tax credit application round that the project truly is shovel ready. And if we receive an award, we'll be ready to go. Scott. Thanks, Kevin. <clears throat> so just a little bit more background on the project history. I, not, I know that all the members uh, of the board here um, were present when we uh, started this project, but Sunset Heights history is now three years in the making. In 2018, uh, we forged this innovative partnership with the Boulder Shelter. It was really a, a pitch um, to their board uh, between myself and Kevin. Uh, that Element was able to sign an agreement for partnership with the shelter, and we were on our way to work together with them to pursue ways to house people experiencing homelessness in Boulder County. And shortly thereafter, uh, we were able to secure sites in both Longmont and Boulder for permanent supportive housing. <clears throat> Indeed, in 2019, we were grateful to the city of Longmont and LHA to help us with an option for the subject property located next to the suites which has excellent attributes for a housing project of this type. We were also grateful, as Kevin mentioned, and I'm sure as you all know, to be recipients of a $100,000 funding from this board to help get the project on its feet. Since then, the housing crisis has only deepened and COVID has further disenfranchised the most vulnerable in our communities. In light of these evolving circumstances, I think we're fortunate that the community has had the Sunset Heights project already in process with, as Kevin mentioned, two tax credit rounds uh, of applications under our belt. Uh, for those of you not familiar with um, kind of how this works, it is indeed a marathon, not a sprint. And it is typical for three or four rounds of applications before a successful award for a project. As mentioned by Kevin, uh, we have one main goal for this project which is between now and next February, when there's another opportunity to apply for tax credits, which is to further develop our plans, obtain full building permits, and demonstrate to CHAPA that we'll be as ready as possible to begin construction once approved for tax credits. Next slide, please. So our request tonight is for an additional $150,000 and a promise to you that we will continue to try to do more with less. While we were able to stretch that initial $100,000 that we were awarded in 2019 to cover initial site due diligence costs, about a third of our ultimate architectural and engineering costs, two market studies and two rounds of CHAPA application fees, we have budgeted for more detailed and costly architecture and engineering work to get the final permit and to have ample budget to make at least two more 9% application rounds in 2022 and 23 respectively. As I mentioned, it's a marathon and not a sprint. We have uh, contributed um, for ourselves um, hundreds of our own hours, week in and week out over the last couple of years to bring this project from aspiration to reality for this community. And we are ready to roll up our sleeves further. It goes without saying, but it's still worth mentioning that neither Element nor any of us individually has earned any compensation for this project in any way. Um, but the project needs this additional funding to help us get to the finish line and ensure that CHAPA tax credit allocators see that we are ready and committed. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. So thinking about design, uh, extensive thought has been put into the design and the services at Sunset Heights to ensure it meets the residents' needs. Sunset Heights brings together Colorado's most accomplished professionals in designing supportive housing. Um, included on the team are ShopWorks Architecture and Bo Simone Consulting. Each are among the country's leaders in designing housing for those who have experienced trauma. And their expertise shows through in the building design as well as in the resident service programming. Additionally, as uh, Kevin mentioned, Sunset Heights will enjoy the expertise of an experienced operating team Longmont Housing Authority will be our property manager and the Boulder Shelter will be the lead services provider. Just to put it all together, all staff at Sunset Heights will receive extensive training from Bo Simone Consulting. We're certainly excited to have what feels like a dream team for Sunset Heights. Depicted in the uh, graphic on the right, all aspects of the project are designed to give residents the four C's, choice, control, 
comfort and community, best practices in permanent supportive housing and trauma-informed design have been incorporated into every aspect of the project to serve future residents. And we believe Sunset Heights will be a project that Ronmont will be proud to have in their community. On the next slide, just some examples of affordable housing communities that Element has developed. Each of us on the team here had affordable housing experience prior to joining Element. It's a passion of ours and we've worked diligently together to create long-term affordable housing options in our community. Uh, the first one pictured there is Nest Communities. Uh, we've converted an existing 238 unit portfolio across several buildings from market rate into permanently affordable apartments using tax credits and in partnership with the city of Boulder. Spark West is a new construction affordable housing community that includes 45 townhomes and flats, also funded with tax credits and City of Boulder funding. The next one is CECLO, which is a new construction mixed use development that included 38 permanently affordable apartments. Uh, CECLO was built in partnership with Boulder Housing Partners and was funded with tax credits. And finally, up here, we have Trinity Commons, which is a mixed use development that included meeting space for Trinity Lutheran Church, um, a city of Boulder owned parking garage and 15 senior affordable apartments. Element is extremely excited to bring our experience, our passion and our energy to Sunset Heights. Next, Catherine, I'll hand it off to you for community collaboration. Thanks, Chris. Good evening to all of you, and thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. We really appreciate it. In our experience, all successful projects rely on great partnerships. We intentionally built the best team for a brand new permanent supportive housing project in Longmont. The shelter will be the service provider. They have an excellent statewide reputation based on results with this community. The city of Longmont has provided pre-development funds and the land. LHA has provided the land and will serve as the property manager going forward. Boulder County is providing funding that will be available at tax credit closing, so we can access it for these important pre-development, uh, this important pre-development work. And as Chris mentioned, the consultants and design team, they are the best in the business. We are proud to be working with them and excited to create a wonderful project for Longmont. And our entire team at Element is working on this project. It's extremely important to us as individuals, as well as our company as a whole. We've seen some results come to fruition from having such a strong team. Throughout all the public meetings and outreach we've already done, we've encountered only support from the community. We thank the city and LHA for their support to date, and we look forward to continuing to strengthen our relationship. And I'll wrap with the three key reasons we're asking for these funds. One, the need for housing the homeless is greater than ever, especially considering the impacts of COVID. Two, we need to move the project forward by obtaining permits, which is an expensive process. And three, by obtaining permits, the project will be more competitive in Chaffa's eyes. This is a really difficult project and some funding support from Longmont will give it a fighting chance. We welcome your questions now. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, any questions or comments from folks, board or staff? So do you wanna go ahead and take down your um, slide presentation? Sure. Thank you. Absolutely. So did everyone notice that Kevin's um, background is Sunset Heights? <laughs> We'd like to improve the rendering. That is very sharp. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Brian. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple questions. I'm familiar with Element um, just in terms of seeing different projects around town and you really do some beautiful development. Uh, so one, I have two questions. One, which is um, given your luxury kind of development experience, how have you applied that towards these affordable housing units? Has there, has there been a crossover? Do you approach them differently? And then the second question is, are these units fulfilling your requirement as a developer to meet low-income housing? Uh, and, and that is not a question intended to be prejudicial. I'm, I'm just trying to understand the context of it. I'm happy to speak. Go ahead, Catherine. Please, after you. Yeah. Um, Everybody at once. <laughs> I think I can tackle the second part really quickly. <clears throat> no, this isn't uh, meeting a requirement. Um, affordable housing projects are important to our entire team. All four of us have backgrounds in affordable housing. Uh, we care about what it, it does for our community and the vibrancy that it, that it brings. So um, this, is, this is a part of our business. Um, over half of our, our company's work in the last five years has been affordable housing. So. Um, I'd say it's just as much of who we are as some of the luxury work. And in, in regards to what lessons do we bring from um, some of our higher end townhome projects and, and that sort of thing, we care a lot about design. And we also know that something doesn't have to be expensive just to be beautiful. Um, I think everyone here knows that getting a project done on budget any construction project can be difficult. And so those best practices of, of managing a project tightly, whether it's a larger budget at the outset or a smaller one, but managing a budget well, managing a contractor well, hiring the right team, um, working diligently to make sure that what the vision everyone has in their minds at the outset comes to fruition are, are practices that we take across our entire company's portfolio. That's great. Thank you, Catherine. I'd love to add one thing if I could, Brian, um, and I really appreciate the question. Um, we've actually done more affordable housing than we have of other types of housing. Um, you use the word luxury. We actually specifically think don't use that word because we feel like it's divisive and we feel like, you know, the words are really important around, you know, the type of properties that we develop and how we communicate um, the purpose of those projects to the community. Um, just as an example, um, for some of the buildings that we managed that we own, um, about 10 years ago, we uh, stopped using the word tenants and we switched to exclusively using the word residents. And we just felt like that gave everybody who lived in the building a, a greater sense of ownership. We stopped calling, um, you know, apartment, um, residences, we stopped calling them units and we started calling them homes and residences. And we just, we really learned a lot um, just with that diverse type of housing that we did, whether it was, you know, um, helping somebody, you know, buy an, uh, a retirement townhome that was, you know, downtown and walkable and had very nice finishes. Yes, many people would call it luxury um, and that's fine. Um, but, you know, doing, you know, diverse types of projects, you know, whether it's uh, that type of project or a PSH project or a workforce project, we're always just, we're trying to help somebody um, achieve something. And uh, it's about people and, um, and the language is really important to us. So I appreciate the question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Other questions? All right. Thank you all for the presentation and additional information. It's very much appreciated. S sounds like people are trying to get to the hockey game. <laughs> How did we depends. <laughs> You know, Kevin, I think it would be helpful. One of the um, one of the board members asked for us to send out copies of the presentation. So I don't think we have your slide deck. So if you could send that to um, 
Molly or Kathy or whatever. Um, and then we will include that in our follow up to the board. Yeah, absolutely, Karen. I, I did send it to Molly earlier. So, oh, okay, uh, never mind. She can never distribute. Mind. Nope, uh, she's got it. To, cool. Yep, never mind. <laughs> And um, hey, thanks everybody for uh, for taking the time this evening. Um, your support so far has been uh, really helpful for the project and further support would help strengthen our application uh, moving forward. So very much appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Brian, did you have something you wanted to add? You have your- Well, your I did, up. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, All right, thank I, you. I just wanted to thank you because I do actually have a, a design background and I believe that good design can be inspiring in any environment. And I feel like what is missing from so many affordable environments is actually inspiration. So uh, I'm glad to hear that your design ethics are transferring over and, and creating the same level of inspiration and joy that uh, we experience through all kinds of homes. Brian, that's a, that's a great compliment. I, I think it's, um, for us, you know, what, one of our beliefs is that, you know, whether we do market rate housing or affordable housing, people shouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. And especially in a project like this, I mean, it comes down to the dignity for the residents. You know, everybody should be um, allowed to have a beautiful home and to be proud of where they live. And uh, that's a lot of what when, uh, what's gone into this project. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right, good night. All right. Um, Karen, what is, or Molly, I guess, what is our next step here with respect to these applications? Um, to make a funding recommendation. Okay. <laughs> or to add, if you have any questions, of course, to, to ask those as well. Okay. That's what I suspected, but I wanted to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, are there comments or questions for staff? Um, Graham, go ahead. Yeah, and some of the applications, they say they're, they're requesting the money as a, a deferred loan or a grant. And is that, are they saying it's up to you guys to decide what's best or, or is it an iteration of the same thing? I think it is that they would look to you as to what your recommendation would be and that those options are what they think the project could support. So there, I mean, then there is a difference between just a straight grant, which the way they wouldn't have to pay back. And then the deferred loan at some point would be paid back. Okay. So, oh, go ahead, Karen. So, um, so since this is really the first time that the uh, advisory board has really been on the ground floor of making these recommendations. So typically for the last, I don't know, what did we say, 15 years, um, you know, this, this initial work and review has been accomplished by the technical review group. So I guess what I would also do is invite staff, so Kathy and Molly, to, um, to really help guide the, um, this discussion Yeah. Yep. So I, I was just going to say, Graham, uh, you, we do have a. Um, I with that to, um, you know, to help with some guidance. Um, Thanks, Karen. An outline of um, generally we do grants if they are primarily serving 30% AMI and below. So we do have kind of a chart that um, and a guidance um, on what we try and try and fall into. Sometimes a project can't support a loan, even though it really should get a loan. And then you have to make some decisions around that. But um, so I am going to pull up the budget for, um, and it's a little different than the one that you saw. Oh, I have to do a screen share first. Sorry. All of these things are different. <laughs> Every platform. All right, so yeah, this one. Okay, so this um, is a little bit updated from um, what went out in your packet just because we keep refining things and finding other things. Um, 
So we've already pulled out um, funding for the rehab program and the program delivery for that. We've already pulled out um, a set aside for housing counseling program and to continue the security and utility deposit um, for um, Homeless Solutions for Boulder County and the funding that Human Service Agency is providing to uh, as locally funded vouchers. So those that would support that program. And then the other thing we've already pulled out is the ongoing payment that we have to purchase the land, uh, nine acres of land at um, the Costco development that the city will um, be working on, on developing in partnership with, I'm sure, several different agencies and entities. And then if you remember um, late last year, I think it was, um, it, the Imagine Rehab Project came in and the consensus of the group was to fund it with 2021 funds because they weren't going to be ready, I think was the reason. Um, and so that has been pulled out um, and that would be a grant because of who they're serving um, with CDBG funds. So, um, the, well, yeah, the only thing that would change that is if they can't support um, paying Davis vacant wage rate. So we'll have to check into that. Actually, I think they fall below that limit for that. So just taking a stab at things. Um, if we keep the rehab, imagine rehab project in CDBG, then the balance left is $342,444. Um, right now I've penciled that totally for Chrisman um, land acquisition per their um, $350,000 request um, as a grant. Um, and then 600 over here in the affordable housing fund um, for that same project. Um, Stonehenge I have put in at 150,000. I am personally a little concerned and I'd be happy to listen to thoughts that others might have that they are at this point, haven't put up any of their own. Um, they are operating the project as a for-profit. Um, having a 100% voucher um, supported project, they should have a lot of cash, <laughs> sufficient cash to have much more reserves than what they have. Um, and I'm assuming what happened when they um, acquired it is that they did not go in and do a rehab at that point in time and have been just using the reserves to do rehab. Um, I don't know um, why they did it that way, but anyway, that's where we're at at this point. Um, and then 150 for the sunset element so that they can continue to um, get their project um, through the development process and ready for permit pulling that I think probably would make a huge difference when they go into Chaffa again um, for that. So again, just throwing this out, any ideas that people have, um, I'd be more than happy. I can, this is a spreadsheet so I can change things around and we can see what it does, et cetera. So um, if there's any project that somebody doesn't think we should fund at all, I'd be happy to hear that as well. I don't know what Molly's, if she has any additional comments to make as well. And I can't see anybody very well, so call out. <laughs> okay, Kimberly. I'm not super familiar with the process that Sunset um, Heights Element was referring to, but it sounds like they've tried several times um, to apply for support. And I'm just curious if they don't succeed, what happens to that investment that we've provided? Um, and like, what's the likelihood that this actually will be developed based off of the history of the project? That is a good question. So um, it is not unusual for projects to take multiple times through the tax credit process because it's highly, highly competitive, especially the 9%, um, because you get so much more equity in that, um, that particular project and there, or program and there's only one funding round a year. So everybody that wants to get the 9% is all going in at the same time and there's just insufficient tax credits to, um, to fund everything. 
Um, the first project, as they said, or the first time they went in, um, as they indicated, they got a lot of good feedback on costs and units and different things that they could do differently. They tightened that down when we went in in this February. Um, the feedback that we got was that they really appreciated all the changes that were made. Um, they thought it was a good, strong project. They chose to fund only three permanent supportive housing projects out of, I think there was six or seven that applied. And the three that they chose to fund were in communities that don't have any permanent supportive housing already. Um, so it's hopeful that with the next fund round in, in February of 2022, with having the, the um, plans through and really being ready to go, pull the permits and, and move immediately, that would be the leg up for, for that next um, go around. If they don't get funded, um, they uh, Element has taken on the, the loan themselves. So they have committed to repaying it um, somehow if the project doesn't get funded, that they will repay it. Um, we don't have any collateral against it. So it's, you know, whether we're willing to, to go to the mat if they don't. Um, but my feeling is probably what they would do is change the project and do something that isn't quite as, um, that could be redeveloped, that isn't permanent supportive, that has all of the um, costs, high costs associated with permanent supportive housing, um, and maybe make it a just a, a regular affordable project um, down there. Then the investment isn't lost, it would be repaid um, you know, with that, that project, that would be my guess. Thank you. That's helpful. That's, that is really helpful. And is, is my understanding correct? I think I read it in there is that their hope with this 150,000 is really to keep moving forward on all the permits and design pieces, um, under the assumption that basically by having those ready to go, they're more likely to get this 9%. Um, so it's essentially this early funding to help get them closer to actually being able to pursue it. Correct. Okay. Other questions or comments, Brian? Thank you. Uh, Kathy, can you remind me, are the affordable housing funds a loan or a grant? So the affordable housing fund has to be loan unless we ask council specifically to allow us to grant them. Um, we haven't done that very often and I don't see a reason to do that with any of these particular projects. Um, so Sunset Heights might be one just because of the incomes they're trying to serve. But at this point, I wouldn't go in and ask for a grant for that unless or until the project doesn't go forward or you know, something happens that they need to, to cut costs further. Um, making it a loan for Chrisman, they're going to loan it into the partnership anyway, so that it becomes part of the equity and the basis points. Um, that's just the way the tax credit runs. So, and even though we would be granting um, the CDBG funds, again, LHA is going to loan it into the project um, so that it, uh, it again, increases basis mm -hmm. and, and equity. Um, so <clears throat> those will eventually get repaid. The 600000 the affordable housing fund loan, will get repaid back to the city. Granting the CDBG funds and them loaning it into the project will get it repaid to the LHA but that won't come back to the city. So it's kind of benefiting oh. the housing authority in that respect. So it's supporting the project in a little bit different way. Yeah. Okay, Karen Phillips. So the uh, Stonehenge, would that be then uh, uh, a loan? So yes, I would suggest it could be a deferred loan repaid in X number of years or when they, next time they refinance it, um, it could be a very low interest rate loan repaid over a longer period of time, even a 0% since they are serving. We didn't get good data on actually what AMI is that they're serving. They just said 50% and below. 
Have you ever been to those apartments? They they need the help. <laughs> they they need that work. Yeah, I think they I think they actually have invested um, since they have taken over um, in the property, probably more so than has been for a while. <laughs> yeah, but it's a need for sure. Yeah, I I also see it with a loan as a way for us to. Um, Molly said that they would um, agree to deed restrict. Um, some of the units as um, permanently affordable um, under our program. So um, having um, a longer term loan in there is going to protect that interest um, in the in the units that they would deed restrict as well. So we would have more, I don't want to say say, but we would have more, um, we would be hearing if they, if and when they refinance, if they do anything um, different with the property, we would be able to find out more quickly because we would have a lien on the property with a loan. Cool, thank you. Just would add, we didn't actually talk, they said they would be interested, they would be willing to have a period of affordability. We haven't actually talked about what that length of period of affordability would be. Their current HUD contract goes through 2031. Now, if we made it a repayment loan over, you know, 10 or 15 years, see what they, they say. They may want it to be coterminous with the Section 8 at 2031. Even if it's that, then we would at least know what is going on with the property. Whereas before, we, didn't, we don't know when it sells. We don't know what they're thinking kind of thing. So... Um, yeah, Kathy and Molly Woods, is there going to be another round of potential applications for this fiscal year or is, is this pretty much it? We're intending to do another one later in the year, probably fall. So if we approved these three, am I reading that right? Sell 35, H is 96% of the budget. You're, we're basically spent. Or, or saying that the fall round would likely not get funded? Well, we would have 400,000 available. Okay, Does it, would that make you nervous given your history of funding rounds and previous year's budget? Should we, should we try to be really cautious now because there's another round coming where we could get more bang for our buck or, or you know, do you think it would be reckless if we approved all these three, given the, the volume of the budget it would eat up right away? Um, I don't think it would be reckless. I think the projects are all um, pretty good ones and, and are needed um, going forward. Um, what we have done in the past with a late um, a fall round that usually goes into um, November, December timeframe, by the time we get everything done, is that we can also look at the next year's funds. And if we have something really good or we have projects that come in at a million and they're all really great, we can go ahead and commit into the next year. I see, okay. But these these three would be looking for an answer, you know, relatively soon probably, huh? Next month or two. Correct. Yeah. Brian? Yeah. Thank you. Uh Kathy, I just want to follow up real quick on your comment, I think, about the, I think it's it was related to the Stonehenge development and what sounded like a lack of uh, their own capital going in. Uh, I may have misinterpreted that, but if I didn't, can you speak to, uh, does that indicate a lack of commitment, like in risk sharing, or does it potentially indicate a lack of capital resources that would be really necessary to continue development. Molly, could you tell anything from their financials or from the audit? My, just off the cuff without having looked too deeply into those is that They've been funding the replacement serve reserves at the required amounts and have been spending. I, I was a little taken aback when she said they've been um, constantly spending it. That wasn't exactly her words, but. Um, I think she said they were drawing on it quarterly and making. Right, right. Very regularly, I think is what she said. Um, 
with the the level of cash flow that they should have off of this project and the small amount of reserves, and I know you're only required to put so many into reserves, I just would think they could afford to do a fairly hefty um, match of this if that is if this is really important to them. So she did send me some information this afternoon um, that I haven't yet had a chance to look at um, about reserves, but she also added that um, in 2022, they'll be um, relaying the asphalt in the parking lot, um, replacing concrete sidewalks and walkways, and in the units, they'll be continuing to invest in appliance replacements, flooring upgrades, cabinet upgrades, and other energy upgrades. So they also have some other plans um, coming up as well. Um, Madeline. I have the same concern uh, or maybe, oh, well, I have the same question that um, Brian just raised based on uh, Kathy, your comment about Stonehenge earlier. And um, at this point, I have the, 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 I mean, I do, I have the same concerns to the extent that I haven't heard anything that has settled that or made me feel comfortable enough to, to vote affirmatively on that. So um, I guess I'm going to be listening for others <laughs> thoughts and recommendations because I don't like with something this important. I just want my vote to count and I want to make the right decision. Uh, very concerned that we make the right decision in this regard. And so, um, yeah, uh, I don't know, even Kathy, I don't know if there's anything else you could say to help us out. Of the, you know, you said, I think a lot, <laughs> but um, I'm not, I'm just not comfortable uh, with that particular one. Okay. And then the other concern was, I heard them say that they've been around since the 90s. And they mentioned some of the things they've done. And so, hmm, hmm, yeah. I, yeah, I'll just hold it that. <laughs> I'll hold well, it right there. And I am perfectly fine if folks aren't comfortable with that one yet. I, I mean, we don't have good bids on it. Um, getting some information on um, what the savings would be to the residents and utilities um, would be good to know, knowing more about um, the reserve replacements. If we wanted to hold on that one and have that, they can come in again the next funding round um, in the fall or whenever we hold the next one, um, that's not unusual either. Yeah, I was okay. gonna add, that I thought the like I the fact that they have bids that are five years old that they don't have anything newer is of concern. Um, right. The fact that they it's not clear how much savings that would give to the residents because um, they mentioned that they had gone through something with the energy audits and it was not going to be enough of a difference to qualify for that. Um, so my question is is like is that still true? Um, and is it still something that like they couldn't get other sources of funding for, um, five years is a long, <laughs> is a long time in the realm of these things for like the mm -hmm. cost of them, but also like energy costs have gone up. Um, the efficiency of those may be a lot lower and there may be even more efficient things that would allow them to qualify for some of that other funding, um, to, for energy efficiency in particular. So, um. I feel like more information would be really helpful there to make sure that it's, we're not just like, hi, here's a hundred, you asked this for money, here you go. Like, I'd like to see them do some, some of that legwork um, to present the case of why, um, why it's needed. So, uh, Kimberly. Just extending the conversation, is it appropriate to ask them to, if they, are able to, to come back and um, provide a level of commitment, um, like a matching amount. Is that something that's done? Um, just to show that, you know, 
that investment as well in the project since they should have the reserves? Yeah, we can ask them for what is the, what are they willing to commit? Or you can, we can go to them and say, we're willing to put in half um, of what it is, but um, you know, I'm a little disturbed by, I, I understand the quick turnaround of the application and not getting bids in, but since it went in and now you could have been getting those bids and had, <laughs> had them ready um, for this meeting um, to have a better idea. So, I mean, I think asking for all of those things, the utility savings, the updated costs and what they're willing to commit as well um, are perfectly legitimate things to go back and say, you know, here's the, here's the issues that we had, strengthen your application and come in next time. Karen, did you have a question? Karen I, I didn't think, you know, the bottom line is the people that live there. And I don't know why we, we don't want to encourage, you know, whatever they need to do to get it to better. But, you know, when you have messed up windows and when, you know, I mean, I had that in my house where there's mold and things like that. The bottom line to me is we're helping the residents. And if but I think I think the concern is, is they're a for profit company and by it is helping the residents, but that it's also helping give them more money um, because they don't have to put the outlay on these windows. So essentially they're choosing not to put the money into it and still profiting from the vouchers and so forth that they're getting. Um, and so, so I mean, that's, to, that's part of my we concern. Need to help them. We need to help that organization to do a better job of submitting or, you know, explaining to them what y'all need from them, you know, and not just slough it off, but to help that company figure out a better way to get that money so the residents can benefit. That's yeah. all I'm saying. What I'm hearing though, is that we expect that they should have the money to do this. And we haven't been given enough information to suggest why they don't um, or why they would need help doing it. Um, so. Um, yeah, I get that. But the bottom line is the residents living there. That's all I got to say. Madeline, did you have a question or no? No, no, uh, nothing other than what I, my, the comments okay. that I made. All right. Can you, I think if you hit the like raise hand button it again, it'll take your little hand off. Oh, that, I'm sorry. I forgot. No, you're take fine. It down. That hand. <laughs> uh, Brian. Hey, thank you, Karen. I just, I wanted to say that I, I really resonate with your point of view that it's, it's the residents that we want to help. It's the people that um, are living there. And I've become increasingly sensitive to this idea of public funding um, really transferring to shareholders because of private lack of accountability. And I, I think that's kind of what's at the question for me is, um, you know, is the organization that is requesting the funds being accountable for their share of what it means to operate these kinds of things to the extent that the money is not it's helping temporarily the residents, but ultimately it transfers to the shareholders if it's not balanced. Um, so difficult question, but thank you, Karen, for raising that because I, I, I agree ultimately the share, the, the residents need to be the beneficiaries. Thank you. So is the will of the group to go back to Stonehenge and say, we need this additional information and come in the next round? Or we could also say we need this additional information and depending on what it comes back in, we'll bring it back to this board and we could, we could fund it separately um, or we could just wait till the next, the next funding round. Kathy, I'd support the latter send them back our concerns and questions and give them another opportunity. Yeah. Okay. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so, so we might help? consider this next month or the month after, depending on when they get the information. Is that what you're thinking? I mean, it's okay with me. I, I don't have the, 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 the next month's agendas in my mind to know if that's reasonable or not, but. 
crammed that in there. That seems okay to me. Uh, I'll say that that seems okay to me. I mean, to the point that Karen and Brian were making, like if they can come back with that information for the company, you know, one of the biggest benefits is going to be in the winter. And so getting it, if, if they come back with it and it's a reasonable, like we see all the information and it seems like a good opportunity, then having that done and finished before the cold weather sets in um, has an earlier benefit to the residents. Um, and so I think, um, you know, not forcing them to wait. Um, I mean, obviously if they don't get on the ball and give us the information and get the bids and so forth, like at a certain point, <laughs> like they're gonna have to wait, but, um, you know, it will also be a signal to us of like their commitment to moving it forward before then. Okay. So I'm gonna zero this just for right now then, and we can take it up later if and when they bring stuff back. Um, does anyone have comments or questions about the Chrisman or the Sunset um, Heights ones? I, I think what you've sort of penciled in here, Kathy, makes sense um, in terms of both of those requests. Um, the fact that both of these, um, you know, that Chrisman has this partnership with LHA already and it, you know, the first one is doing so well, um, I think really, you know, just bodes well for it. Um, I also really liked that they highlighted, and I think staff highlighted this as well, of them having three bedrooms that are so needed um, that that is really not something. Um, and I, that barbell of like income of like trying to hit those areas that are not well done um, seemed really useful. And it's, a, it's quite a few units um, all at once. So um, yeah, what you have makes sense to me. I'm curious if other folks have thoughts or concerns about what's pen sort of penciled in here. Let's do it. <laughs> Brian? I would move that we approve the uh, Chrisman 2 project for 600,000 in affordable housing funds and 350,000 in CDBG. Uh, actually, Kathy, am I working off of the wrong uh, I interrupt my movement for clarification from Kathy. Uh, am I working off of the wrong sheet here? Because it seems we we're looking at 150 and 150. It, uh, for Chrisman, it should be 342, 444 for land acquisition and 600,000 from the affordable, or from CDBG as a grant, and then 600,000 from the affordable housing fund as a low interest loan. And I would ask that I have the ability, which I did not have an opportunity to do, is get with our consultant to figure out what the project can afford to pay back to set the interest rate and term. Um, and a further point of clarification, they actually requested 350 in grant funds, right. but we, because of the previous funding, approval for Imagine, right. we only have 342, uh, yeah. which is still pretty close to what they asked for, but not exactly. Yes. Okay. So Karen, is there somebody working magic on your end that can turn that into a uh, organized motion? <laughs> because I- Do you <laughs> do you want to do you want to move to approve the you know the remaining CBDG funds for Christmas and the six hundred thousand in affordable housing loan with the yeah. term term and I do. Um, interest rate to come. I I do want to move that. Yes. Okay. Do we have a so, second? Second. A okay, Graham seconds. All those in favor for the Christmas to the numbers that you see on the screen. And, and I think, and Caitlin, just to clarify that, that then you're authorizing uh, staff to, um, to do a little more work about the terms of the low interest loan. Yes, that okay. is correct. 
um, based on what the, the project can afford um, right. to pay and what makes sense in terms of the term and interest rate. All those in favor, please raise your hand. This is for the Christman two. Okay. Madeline, are you, uh, if you're opposed on Chris, on the Christman two one? Oh, no, you're in favor? Okay, so we've got everyone in favor. It's it's the finger, Caitlin. You gotta recognize the one I know. finger that Madeline puts up. Okay. Um, that leaves us with the Sunset Heights pre-development and the request for the loan. Um, they asked for either grant funding or a low interest loan there. So since our grant funding is depleted, then um, we, have, we would look to do a low interest loan for them. And Molly, do you remember the terms that the initial one's under? I think it's 0% interest in repaid in by March of 2022? April of 2022. April of 2022. So I would suggest the same terms. Which is like a two year, was that like two or three year term basically? Zero percent? Yeah, it would be uh, a two year term from the time we actually signed the contract. Okay. So Molly, I'm sorry for the notes. Did you say a two-year term? Yes. Thank you. And I'm also hoping you're taking notes, Molly, yes. like you usually do. Yes, I'm counting is. on it. <laughs> it is recorded too. If we have to, go I know, back and I listen. know, <laughs> I know. Um, so if the if the the current one is repaid in is to be repaid in, would you say April of 2022? Yes. Then this one would not be a two-year term if we made it coterminous to be repaid at the same time, it would be the 18 month maybe, or maybe a year by the time we get paperwork or less than a year. So mm -hmm. Kathy, are you recommending that it be a coterminous or that we do the two years? Um, I'm kind of curious with respect to that, when that next application round would be and when they would get it to make sure that they, you know, assuming they can get everything done, can they get the permitting done that they want in a year? And will they have enough time to sort of have information on that 9% by the time this, this one comes due? Okay. Um, so my thinking in making it coterminous with the existing one is that we would be able to amend the existing agreement and just add funds to it. And they are not likely to hear on uh, in February 2022 until May or June of 2022. So they're gonna have to come in and ask for an extension anyway. And that way we can extend both at the same time instead of having two different agreements with two different terms. That was my thinking of why we would make it coterminous. Would it? would it make sense to have them coterminous and go ahead and do an extension to June? I wouldn't do it at this point in time. If they, if they I, I wouldn't do it at this point in time, I'd wait, yeah. Other questions or thoughts on the Sunset Heights request? Okay, do we have a motion to um, approve the 150,000 in affordable housing um, with direction to staff to look to have that coterminous with their existing um, loan and the same terms, um, which was 0%. Does anyone wanna make that motion? Karen Phillips, we have a second. I make a motion. Oh. Shakita has seconded. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, you got it, Karen. Okay, and that has passed. Thanks everyone. 
And oh, and ahead. so, Caitlin, did you get a, an official motion in regard to the uh, Stonehenge? No, we did project. not. So we... y'all, there was a there was the makings of a motion, but it wasn't a real motion. Yes. I don't think. So, I, I motion that with the Stone Hedge project, uh, we return to the applicant and request further clarification and information uh, up to and including a contractor bid for windows that's updated, information concerning prudent reserves, expenditure, and uh, thirdly, the um, amount of uh, a request for some capital ownership given the organization is a for profit. I agree. Uh, uh, second. Match. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. So approved. So Caitlin? Yes. Karen again. So I'm having internet instability. Um, so who seconded the motion? Uh, that would be Madeline. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. No problem. That dang next slide. No, it's that dang husband. He touched the router. Oh. And now, <laughs> as soon as he has, after he touched the router, I have been having issues. <laughs> well, you were a lot more composed than my 10 year old was earlier today when he got kicked out of his online class twice. Oh. And he was like literally in tears, like saying that the computer didn't work and it hated him. And I was like, you have to talk really nice to it. And, like, and he was like, you're weird. Yeah, I could do that. I could have me a temper tantrum, <laughs> but I won't. Um, all right. It looks like our next item is the CDBG annual performance report. That is me again, and I am going to share my screen again. If I can find it, here it is. All right, so this is really little. Um, hopefully you could see it when you on your own screen. Um, but this just kind of goes through and shows um, what was um, projects were approved for 2020 and or carried over from prior years, um, what the budget was going into 2020, what the um, expenditures were in 2020, and um, what we're carrying forward into 2021. And then this also shows um, for each type of project, um, the beneficiaries that were um, supported um, with the project or assisted with the project. And then it does give, give information as well on the percentage of admin funds that we spent, the amount and percentage, um, the leveraging that we did, and um, the low and moderate income percentage uh, of uh, residents that were served with the, the projects that we funded. Um, so we, uh, we met our timeliness um, requirement uh, that HUD sets, um, which was good, but we didn't do overall a very good, great job of um, how much we, we spent in 2020. Um, and there were a lot of reasons for that with COVID and things slowing down and stopping and our rehab program, we put um, a hold on because nobody wanted us in their houses to inspect. They didn't want contractors coming in. So um, there wasn't a whole lot we could do in that program and some other ones um, were slow as well. So um, it was a kind of a weird year. We were hoping to make greater strides. Um, the admin ratio, is um, we had about 15% of our funds spent were um, for admin. Um, so that means about 85% was um, for projects. And then we had a, over a 98% um, expenditure rate for low and moderate income um, residents that were served. <clears throat> All right, hold on a second. Sorry. All right, let me bring up my, sorry. All 
Let me open this file again. It's not. I don't update it. Why is that one? Sorry. So, so while Kathy's uh, looking for her doc, so, um, Caitlin, I thought it would check in. I know, um, you know, it's it's nearing nine o'clock. We had the site visit updates. I know Deanna isn't able to be here. So I don't know whether if Shakita wanted to make her um, report or whether we wanted to wait until the next meeting. So I just was planning that, asking that question actually. Shakita, are you um, in a position to go forward with any of the reports or would you like to um, go hold off until next next month? What's your preference? <laughs> um, it will be great to hold off until next month, but if you are just so anxious to hear about what I don't remember, um, I'm totally <laughs> ready to, you know, be submissive and give you what I can recall. Sounds like next month. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like next month would be great. I'm pretty sure Shakita is never ready to be submissive in any way, <laughs> but I appreciate the suggestion. <laughs> sure. I think that was a good call. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy, do you have your stuff ready or should? Yes. Okay. I can get to the back where I need to be. Okay. I think it's this one. It's hard to tell where you're. There we go. All right. All right, so this one again in um, total shows the CDBG funds um, and expended that came into um, the program year from 2019, which is at about 1.1 million. And then we got 610,000 in uh, 2020 CDBG funds. We got about 105,000 in program income this year and we repurposed about 99,000. Um, so our total budget was 1.7, um, in 2020 um, that we had available. We had 1.1 um, million in expenditures, which carries us into um, with 730,000 going into uh, 2021 um, of unspent funds. As uh, CDBG funds spent uh, or budgeted as a total uh, percentage of the total budget, 80. 9% has been budgeted for housing, about 6% for planning and administration, and then we had about 5% in unallocated funds in 2019. Um, and then this just shows, um, again, the funds that were not allocated in 2020. Um, the blue is what was budgeted, the red what was is what was spent, so housing, um, you can see the difference there, and then planning um, and administration, we pretty much spent what we said we were going to, or thought we were going to. Um, this one shows the um, projects on a project basis, um, what was, get over here, uh oh, so you can see the, um, what was budgeted, what was spent, and then what was carried forward. So in, um, in the general rehab program, we had this much budgeted, we spent this much again because of COVID and the, the shutdown. So we're carrying forward um, quite a bit. 
um, architecture barrier removal, we did a little bit better in getting that spent. Mobile home repair, same thing. Um, and then emergency grant um, is a pretty small amount to begin with. The Boulder County Housing Counseling Program spent what they had budgeted um, for the R Center. Um, this is showing next to nothing spent. We did actually have some funds spent um, at the very end of 2020. Um, and it's either not showing up very much or it didn't get caught. The security deposit funds for 2020 did not get spent because we haven't stood up the locally funded voucher program yet. We're working on that. In between um, the rehab of uh, 1901 Terry Street, they spent, yay, um, and got that project completed in 2020. Um, and then they also purchased a, an additional building um, with the funds that they received um, in 2020. And then the Aspen Meadows um, relocation funding that we set aside um, to support the additional, um, what we thought was gonna be additional need uh, during COVID to have extra cleaning, extra time out of the units, that kind of thing. It ended up that we stayed within budget um, that we had. And so we are going to be um, recommending to repurpose the relocation money um, to offset um, the, the principal loan um, to make a, a, a principal reduction payment um, at the once it goes to um, final closeout. Um, and then Aspen Meadows uh, refinance and rehab project. Again, this was the money that we uh, set aside and then spent to um, purchase the building uh, in order to rehab that. So we purchased it out of the par partnership and uh, put it back into the new partnership. Um, this is something a little different this year that I went ahead and did. Um, it shows the low moderate income beneficiaries served by area median income. So as you can see, um, over 53% of the funds that we did spend um, served people below 30% area median income. Um, about 28% served um, 31 to 50% AMI. Um, <clears throat> about 14% served um, 51 to 80. And then we did have a few that were served um, above 80%. And this is primarily in the housing counseling program because um, they don't uh, aren't limited to being um, serving primarily low income, but um, that's the way it usually ends up. Um, and then some of the demographic data. Um, and again, I'm not sure I can. Ooh, ooh. Went the wrong way. Trying to get it so I can read. There we go. <laughs> so about 44% of our funds um, went to um, white only um, beneficiaries. We had 14% uh, for Latino Hispanic um, folks, um, other races other than white, about 8% of our funding. Um, elderly um, benefited about 8, 12% of the folks were um, elderly that benefited. Uh, about 7% had some type of disability, and then about 15% were female heads of household. And, and these are categories that we do report to HUD on. Um, that's why I'm showing those there. And, oh, I'm pushing the wrong button, sorry. <laughs> um, and then this is the CDBG uh, COVID funding, the special funding that we got um, to assist with COVID. Um, so we had budgeted uh, quite a bit of money to the R Center for rent and utility assistance for folks that um, had impacts from, from COVID. Again, this took a while to get um, uh, brought into under contract and get uh, them going and uh, serving folks. So we didn't get too much of the money spent um, in 2020. Um, because of that, it was all mostly towards the end of the year. Um, we did also pay for them to hire somebody to help operate the program, and that's what the program administration is showing there. Um, and then we did set aside funds to um, support the uh, COVID Recovery Center operations, and those funds we have not gotten um, a bill yet. I think they're still trying to figure out um, funding and what other sources they might be able to bring to bear. So we may be coming back and reprogramming um, some of the some of this COVID funding at this point in time. Do we have a sense of 
you have these numbers for carrying forward. Do we have a sense of like how much of that has been spent? You know, we're almost halfway through the year. Um, has have we actually made more of a dent in that individual assistance or anything in 2021? Do we know? Yes, Molly. Do you remember? Is Molly still on? Does she remember what we? If not, I've got some figures somewhere I can look up. It, I think they spent about two hundred and forty thousand. So it, it does look better um, once we got the bills for January, February, March timeframe. Yeah, I think it was. Ju it's just over half, or just right around half of what they've gotten. Okay. Karen, are they going to be able to, with their remaining program administration funds, administer that really large amount that they had carry over? Do you know? Well, they had only asked for staffing um, to uh, get it stood up, really, and get processes and procedures in place. Um, they should be able to move forward. Um, although I will say, they have um, put our program on hold and are now working on county funding, which has a lot less restrictions and caveats and documentation. Uh, so we do have a call in to them and a meeting set up to um, by the end of this month to talk to them about what is the ongoing need going to be uh, for the rest of the year? Are these funds gonna get committed and spent? Um, or should we be looking at reprogramming them for something else? So there's a lot of money coming into the county for rent and utility assistance. Um, another 15 million, I think, is, is coming in. Uh, so my guess is, um, and that has, a, again, a lot fewer conditions on it, that, um, that they're probably going to prefer to spend that money, <laughs> quite and frankly. Is the hour center um administering all of that money that came into the county or is it actually um across organizations that are that can access that or are they just like connecting folks to the county resources yeah i think it's more connecting folks and karen maybe you've been um on the the funders collaborative i have i have not lately um but the county, I think, was not going to grant it down to the Family Resource Centers, but it was going to run through the housing helpline. I think Alberto can answer that. Okay. Yeah, so the county received, I think, in, in total, is going to be about $17 million for housing, uh, for rental support. Um, and there, and right now, it, there, it is going through the housing helpline. It is not going through the, the Family Resource Centers, the R Center, F uh, and Sister Carmen, uh, they're referring uh, that being said, there are still um, uh, clients that do access uh, the IR Center's help because they might need it faster than what the county can do or because some folks, um, due to documentations, uh, may be wary of accessing government support. So that, that's kind of where it is right now. Uh, Kathy, do the those com are those funds competitive, or do they continue to meet the needs that we've identified in Longmont? The county funds. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by competitive. Um, well, like as an agency, if I choose to serve Program B instead of Program A, and Program A was designed to meet the needs of Longmont residents. Uh, are the county funds, if our center is choosing to focus on the county funding, or is it still meeting the needs of Longmont residents as we've identified, or are those so different I, needs that the county has identified? So I don't think the our center is choosing. Um, I think what they're doing is, I mean, they're referral source, uh, referral source to, so, so the, the housing helpline is the big bucket of funding right now. Um, it's, it's, it's more, it's actually more, more flexible than CBDG funding, less requirements, uh, documentation is not an issue. Okay. Um, so I, I don't think it's about choosing. It's about where is the most bang for your buck yeah. at, at this point. So it sounds like it's helpful to Longmont residents. Yeah. And Very I think the, so, yeah. and I think the, uh, only thing is Kathy mentioned that, you know, staff is planning to, um, is to plan to meet with the R Center, you know, to really help, I think, assess that. So there, there are.
I think uh, Karen, she, she went oh. unstable again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That router, my husband. <laughs> so, um, so anyhow, so I'm sure that we will be having a better handle on that after that meeting with the R Center. I have a question. Caitlin. Go ahead, Madeline. Uh, <clears throat> Kathy, when you were going through the demographics, mm -hmm. um, uh, you, um, there was one category that I um, trying to remember. I think it was classified as other. Uh, I'm look. I'm trying to see what. <laughs> I'm looking at your chart, trying to see it. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. That's right, Madeline. I guess my other okay, races. I guess. My, I'm sorry. What'd you say, Brian? I didn't mean to interrupt. It's the other races than white was the category. Okay. Uh, I, <clears throat> I am curious to know where do the African Americans fit in this in the scheme of this this information? They would fall into that one, the other races than white. Uh, are we not able to capture that and break it out to the most finite um, detail? I am finding it. Because it was fairly small numbers, I thought it was a better way to group that we do have on this chart. It should break it out by, okay. nope, it, that must be what HUD calls it. Uh, we can get that information because um, we, it, that is not the category that people uh, check <laughs> on, on their applications and stuff. Um, so we can we can get that and break that out. Uh, I'd li I'd like to know because if it's not if it's the number is so low, then that raises a question to me as to why. Why it certainly isn't that there is to need, mm -hmm. uh, but if the information you know if the information is not disseminated, then right. we need to do right. some other things differently, perhaps. Absolutely. But just based on what I, yeah, just based on what I know personally. Uh oh, Madeline went unstable too. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm kind of surprised. Thank you, Shakita. Yeah. I just want to uh, follow up with Madeline, and I think it's important to. I know where she's coming from. I get what she's saying. Um, even though we have a small population of African Americans, but we also have Asians, we have Native Americans that live in Longmont, and I think it would be. I mean. When we look at that and we, I'm under other, it's like mixed races now are still in that other box. That shows that we are invisible. And so these programs are out here for everyone. Am I right? Mm -hmm. And so back to what Karen Phillips used to say, how are, how is the community getting this information knowing that this assistance is out here for everyone? So I know people who are in need, and if they don't know that, hey, you can apply for this, you can apply for that, or this, or, you know, business know that, that could be African-American, that could be Asian, whatever, right? So maybe we have to do more of an outreach to that demographic, because we're here, because you you looking at me and Madeline. So we are here, you know, so that's very important. She brought, She's bringing up a really good point. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be in the other box because I'm here. That's just like saying you don't see color. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we do, we do uh, make sure that we know that, and we all know that we're here. Yeah. How many Asians? How many Native Americans? How many uh, African Americans? Mm -hmm. You know, it's important. It's important to me. Okay. So I just wanted to break that down a little bit in case you all was wondering why, but. And maybe we have to do more outreach. That's I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, I think that makes I make that sense. And, you know, I think it sounds like that we, you know, so our, our default is this is what HUD asks us to report on. Um, and it and it sounds like we certainly have the capacity to report, um, you, you know, in a more granular way. 
with that information. And that sounds like that would be super helpful for us to have and know that. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and I, I wanted to, um, Shakita raised uh, also just brought something else to mind. If you guys remember, I mentioned to you uh, about an Asian family that was in desperate need. And now it's been since they originally applied, it's been well over a month and a half, two months. Do you know that they haven't heard not one word, one word? And I, I um, of course, I was out of town when I got back. I checked to say, you know, have you heard from anybody? Not a word. I'm so embarrassed. And so <sighs> we can take it offline. I'll talk to, because Alberto was helping. Um, trying to help them, and uh, and so was Adriana Perea. So, um, but 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 I'll, I'll you know what I'll just follow up with the call. But she brought that when, when Shakita was talking, that that reminded me of that specific that specific um, situation with them. And and I, I'm talking about a family that's in desperate need. So yeah, so I, I think it it, it lends. Uh, to my thought process that yeah, we, we need to fix, we need to do something differently. And if HUD is doing that, then we need to straighten HUD up. <laughs> oh, I'm done. If, if only we could straighten HUD up, that would be so, we would love that. <laughs> uh, all right, then the final thing that I have, and I, de I definitely will get you that information. I will send that out and we'll have that for you. So then the last um, piece on the performance report, even though it's not um, CDBG related, it's the Affordable Housing Fund. Um, and this last sheet just shows again, what we had budgeted, um, the expenditures that we um, had in 2020. Um, one project went forward, we had um, some matching funds um, and then um, what it gets carried over into to 2020 one somewhere down here and it also shows um how much in administration we spent as well um so in this particular in 2020, 2020 we had a 49 percent expenditure rate we did leverage about one dollar and 26 cents for every one dollar we um loaned out um and had about 14 percent of our our funding was was admin so Things got a little balled up um, with COVID and making progress on, on projects, but um, we are trying to get back on track for 2021 and start getting things going and moving forward. So I will stop sharing so you don't have to look at this anymore. Thanks, Kathy. Um, are there other questions or comments for Kathy? Brian. Sorry, Caitlin. Oh, uh, no apology. <laughs> Kathy, real quick. Uh, failure to spend funds, does that harm future applications? For CDBG, um, as long as we meet our timeliness standard um, each year, we are not in danger of losing funding or um, not getting future funding. Um, at the point where we routinely don't meet the timeliness, that would theoretically be when they would either recapture funds or um, lower, start lowering our, our grant amount. Um, but so far every year we, we meet the timeliness standard. So um, we just want to get on ahead of it. And so um, uh, exceed the timeliness ratio that we're, we're required to do. So a couple of years we've done it and we just, a couple of years, we just been hanging on, met it by the skin of our teeth. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Any any other questions for Kathy? All right. And we determined that we're going to move the site visits to next month. So we're on to other business. And it looks like we've got one item there. Um, the plan to return to in-person meetings. 
So I think we we touched on this a little bit last month and um, we're waiting maybe for a little bit more information. Um, Karen or it, it, go ahead. Maybe Karen froze again. She might have to turn off her video. It I think it's really it's um, OK. I'm not frozen now. <laughs> so so the, the council is returning to in-person meetings on the 29th of June. So. So it is really up to the advisory board. If you want to continue. To down a virtual path. <laughs> Sorry. So, so I think it's really up to the board, Caitlin, if you, okay. if you want and Aliberto, maybe you take this. So, so, but it's up to you whether you want to start meeting in person or not and when. Okay. Um, do does anyone have strong feelings one way or another? Anyone want to chime in? I, I, I'm, 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 I need to remain virtual uh, for health reasons. Um, yeah, I have some health situations coming up at, very soon. And so, yeah. My participation would have to remain uh, virtual. All right. I Any support. I I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd say at least through, uh, not not indefinitely, but from what I know about what I'm about to face, it would be at least through through August. I'd say so. Just based on what I know. Okay. Thanks for sharing that, Madeline. And Brian, it sounded like you were saying you'd support either option. Okay. Is hybrid an option, Alberto? That's, that's what I was going to say. I mean, if we could find a proper conference room, and I'm thinking about, Karen, the, the one at the city manager's office, if it's available. So what I, what I know is that, it, maybe we can do a little more research. I know that the... Um, that the, the city staff is trying to retrofit some of the equipment so that there would be the opportunity to have hybrid meetings. So why don't you let us, um, let's do some work and then we'll follow back up with you and, and, and give you an update on if that is possible and, uh, and that we could, and if you wanted to pursue hybrid in July, you know, we could. So we'll get back to you about that. So um, based on Madeline's comment and then the fact that the mask stuff is expiring today, my feeling is that, um, I mean, my sense is that virtual has generally been working well. Um, we've sort of got a process here. I would suggest that we plan to stay virtual for July um, so we can see whether things change as more people are going out without masks and all of that. Um, and then give staff some time to do some research and come back to us in July with that. Um, I sort of have this like nervous that we are removing this mask stuff, but we are not like Boulder County is very well vaccinated, but I'm a little I'm a little nervous with all the kids um, starting to go to summer camps and interacting with other people of like how much we're going to see. Um, so um, that would be my thinking was, would be to just plan to be virtual for July, get some more information and then um, revisit this then. We, we can do that. So. That works for me. Okay. Looks like Folks are in agreement there. Karen, Kimberly, Graham, does that sound workable for all of you? Okay. Then let's do that. Um, and, so, and so, Caitlin, the only other update I have is, um, is that we have received two applications for the our open slot that was vacated um, and that we didn't get it, you know, we didn't recruit it at the time of the year end re recruitment. So, um, so it, it should be the council will be doing interviews 
yet in June. And so it looks like we will be able to fill our um, our open seat on the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board at mid-year. Great. Yep. Great. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Any other business that folks have? Soon. I have one announcement. Okay. Go uh, ahead, Madeline. Am I, am I on mute? No, nope, okay. you're fine. We can hear you. Um, okay. Um, June 19th, next Saturday, we will be celebrating Juneteenth in Boulder County. Uh, the, it's the Executive Committee for African-American cultural events in conjunction with the Boulder County NAACP and many other sponsors. Uh, we are um, preparing or we have designed a virtual production that will air June 19th, the actual day of um, at 10 a.m. And I will send information. Uh, Karen, should I send that to you? if you haven't already received it. You can send it to me. Okay. Uh, 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 an, an added uh, great event. Well, you know that our, our special guest, our featured guest is the 94 year old Miss Opal Lee, who's known as the grandmother of Juneteenth. She's our featured guest and many, many other exciting things. But we have recently added another feature we're gonna have a flag raising ceremony at, uh, the, at the Civic Center, 350 Kimbark. That's gonna be Monday at 11 a.m. Mayor Bagley, along with the Juneteenth Planning Committee and city council members, and just a whole host, this invitation has gone out all over. And we hope to just have a great crowd out there that we will do the flag raising service. It will be filmed to be included in the production. So I'm all excited about that. Uh, another initiative that's un, uh, underway is we're trying to get all of the cities within Boulder County to raise flags and fly those flags on June 19th at 10 a.m. And uh, the surge show up for racial justice, that organization is um, spearheading that effort. So we're looking forward to a great event. Uh, I know a lot of people still don't know about Juneteenth, still don't know what it is, and that's okay. Because if you watch June 19th, Saturday at 10 a.m., you will learn. And that's what we are about with ECASE, the um, Executive Committee for African-American Cultural Events, NAACP and all of the other uh, organizations. We got so many people sponsoring us. Even High, High Plains Bank came on board yesterday. And so uh, I'm, I'm really encouraged by just the support and the interest. So you're invited. I hope to see you Monday at uh, 11 at uh, the Civic Center. Thank you for allowing me to share that. Thank you, Madeline. Anyone else? If not, we will entertain a motion to adjourn. Nobody wants to, to leave? I move we adjourn. Okay. Second. <laughs> Off we go. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs>